please. Okay, thank you very much. Morning. Uh, so, um, we so in recent uh, year, there has been really a tremendous uh, progress in uh, understanding uh, quantum mechanics with infinite degrees of freedom, alias uh, uh, quantum field theory. And uh, one of the basic uh, tool in this progress has been indeed uh, conformal field theory. Now, conformal field theory is a special branch of uh, quantum field theory, which presents a scale invariance, as we will see in detail later. Uh, ironically, uh, he started uh, just for solving a specific theory, that was Liouville, and, uh, and the first attempt failed. So, uh, even, uh, even though the subject developed in its own, becoming a great success, also in the number and um, many significant number of applications in physics. And with this, I'm uh, thinking about the classification of class of universality of uh, phase transition. I'm thinking solution like the condo problem. I'm thinking uh, like string theory. I'm thinking uh, the reason developed in entanglement. But uh, remarkably, uh, it's been very instrumental also in uh, uh, extraordinary uh, development in uh, mathematics. And uh, uh, for instance, I'm uh, thinking uh, even uh, the famous uh, conjecture of moonshine with the monster group that has been approached by conformal field theory, as well as all development of modular form, as well as uh, development of uh, tensor category, as well as development of anions, and so on and so forth. So, from what I just said, you understand that the, the subject is really uh, large, pretty deep in all uh, its aspects, and uh, having uh, just 12 hours or so to cover it would be impossible to touch all aspects of this. So I took the point of view to guide uh, you in understanding uh, such beautiful theory using essentially the example, or if you want, the guiding uh, vocabulary of phase transition. Now, this is not at all limitative, because uh, phase transition, or vocabulary borrowed from this, is very, very common in many other fields of physics, essentially concerned with anomalous singularity of uh, behaviors, okay? under essentially renormalization group transformation. So. Uh, with that said, let me therefore introduce some uh, examples, some thematics. So today I will spend a uh, uh, certain time in uh, giving you really the main ideas behind all this subject so that uh, it's better to have a clear uh, idea about the concept and uh, about the application rather than jumping directly in the technicality that uh, we will have, of, of course, in the due course of, uh, of the lectures. So let me just give you a few examples and uh, general, uh, general frame uh, in which conformal field theory will be uh, taught at least here. So I had in mind to have a statistical, let's say classical, statistical uh, uh, mechanic system. You know that classical in D dimension is equal to quantum in D minus one as far as you have uh, uh, symmetry like rotation, translation, and so on and so forth. So classical is not uh, mean to be limitative at all, but just to set the, the language. Now, is a good idea to define such a system on a lattice, which has certain lattice Space. Now, square, once again, is not important. Could have been triangular, could be random, could be a, a dimension D, let's say. The important thing is that on the lattice I have a scale, a microscopic scale, which is A, the lattice spacing, which in field theory will provide uh, some kind of regularization for infinite that will pop up anyway in the, in the system. So, 
Lattice is a way of regularizing the theory. Of course, the physics will emerge when you take A goes to zero and how to do this limit. So that being said, our classical system will be defined in terms of a lattice and in, uh, in uh, terms of some uh, fluctuating variable defined on the site, which I call spin. Spin stays for a generic name, namely a variable that takes certain uh, number of uh, uh, values. Okay? So under this framework, of course, we can uh, set many, many familiar examples. So let me just uh, state a few just to provide uh, uh, So the simplest and most notorious example is when a sigma take value 0 and 1, or minus 1 and 1. And uh, uh, I have, uh, as we will see in a minute, an important quantity that play a role is also the symmetry group under which this system is invariant. So the first example is the famous uh, easing model, in which, as I say, the sigma i take value plus and minus 1. And then you take uh, Hamiltonian, which is uh, of this type, where we have, uh, as a coupling constant, we'll play a role in a minute, uh, the, the coupling constant uh, space. We have two of them. The, f the first is J, next neighborhood uh, interaction. The other one is a magnetic field. Now, this example is uh, a prototype of many uh, later uh, concepts because uh, this uh, system is invariant under a group. In this case, it's a very simple group. is Z2, which consists in sending sigma i minus sigma i. As you can see immediately, there are a term which is invariant under the group and a term which explicitly breaks it. Okay? So this is a general concept which appears uh, in... Uh, in a minute uh, uh, in our uh, uh, further discussion. Namely, any statistical system will be encoded in some group which uh, give us the symmetry. Then you have among this group those which explicitly respect the symmetry and those that explicitly break the symmetry. Okay? So in this example, this monomial written in terms of the Variable is Z2 invariant, while this term here, alone, is, of course, explicitly uh, breaks the Z2 invariant. Okay? So this is the first example. Other more sophisticated example is if you take Pot's model, where the variable, in this case, assume uh, Q values that colloquially you might call colors. In this case, the symmetry that you want to study, and this is why Pot's model has been introduced and invented, is the permutation of Q object. And the Hamiltonian which uh, respects this symmetry is something like uh, delta sigma i sigma j next neighborhood. Okay? Now, you see this model, for instance, is a beautiful for many, many... Uh, instances of mathematics. So if you take antiferromagnetic and you go to the deep J infinity limit, this is mapped in the so uh, famous uh, uh, Q-color problem, namely in how many possible different way you can color a lattice having a Q-color at your disposal, such that nearest sites do not share the same color. Okay? And this has to do with the famous conjecture of four colors in two dimensions, namely that you can uh, only need four color to color any possible planar map. Now, another example is uh, something of continuum, so kind of a spin uh, continuous model, in which you take your variable to be a vector of dimension uh, n, the symmetry group in this case uh, you want to study is ON, is a continuous one. And then you have something like Heisenberg uh, model in which you put an interaction, something like sigma i, sigma j, so that if you rotate with a general, I mean, uh, with a global uh, transformation sigma in a rotation, this, uh, the scalar product of the two vector will not change. 
Okay, now these are all examples just to set the stage. But the real uh, concept uh, problem is uh, with a formulation uh, the way I, I gave. When I have a model defined on a lattice, essentially I have two scales to deal with. One is a macroscopic scale, which is A, which is really under our eyes. So how large is uh, the uh, separation between the neighborhood uh, site on this, on this lattice? So this is a macroscopic scale. But then there, there, are, there is a, a dynamical scale which emerge really depending on the coupling constant the system is subject to. So this is the correlation length. Okay, so the correlation length, whose definition can be given, uh, can be given uh, uh, precisely in terms of the exponential decay of the two-point function, is uh, roughly speaking how far two variables are uh, connected each other significantly. So if one updates its value, how far this is felt in the lattice? Okay, so what are the spin that really knows uh, that something has happened at the site R? Okay, so it's essentially an area which uh, tells us the spread of information on the lattice and those which are far off this are essentially uncorrelated. Okay, so the name itself stays for what, what it is. Now the fact is that while A is given once for all, so if you give a crystal, the lattice space of the crystal is what it is, so you cannot do much. The correlation length on the other end depends on the coupling constant that the system is subject to. Okay? So this means that you can vary the correlation length at your wish, just tuning the coupling constant. Now, uh, let's uh, uh, spend a few times in understanding how we generally approach uh, system in physics. So, of course, a successful paradigm is when uh, you solve essentially one uh, one degrees of freedom problem, eventually treating all the other as effective Hamiltonian for that variable. So this is essentially the essence of mean field. So in mean field, even though the system cooperatively interact one to the other, each degrees of freedom, what you do, you focus the attention on one of them, and then you say, let's assume that they all the other play the role of uh, an effective field for the variable I'm looking for, hoping that this will capture the dynamics. Now, this is true as far as the correlation length, of course, is finite. And this approach to have kind of uh, three part, well, three part, one particle uh, body, uh, and systematically probably improving this is essentially based on the idea that uh, once the correlation length is uh, small, all the variables which enter the dynamics are small. So you can try to treat perturbatively it, okay? Now, obviously, this approach will miserably fail if the correlation length start to grow and start to diverge and start to arrive, let's say, to the size of the system. Because at that point, the effective degrees of freedom that you have to deal with is a C to the dimension of the lattice. Okay? So you can never neglect that there are all the others because if something happens here, D, C to the D variable will fill it. So it will be impossible to separate the dynamics of one spin from all the others. And moreover, when C is going to infinity, which is what uh, signals a phase transition, at this point you think that you are in big trouble because the system at once has an infinite degrees of freedom to be dealt with. Okay? 
So from that, uh, from what I say, that seems therefore hopeless to try to approach a study of uh, phase transition in terms of the usual scheme. So scheme in which systematically you try to increment, increment the number of degrees of freedom put in the problem, hoping that uh, some convergence will be reached. However, as happens uh, uh, many times in physics, one difficulty turns out to be an advantage. So in this case, the advantage is that uh, when C goes to infinity, even though the degrees of freedom become infinitely many large, you have an extra symmetry. So you acquire symmetry. And this symmetry will be the key that will allow us indeed to solve and crack successfully the, uh, the theory. So the symmetry is uh, when x is going to infinity, since everything will depend on dimensionless quantities like c divided by a, at this point c infinity is as much as quotation, I can disregard all the microscopic detail of my model, okay? So essentially, instead of focusing my attention on how the model is built up, I can rather focus on the most general properties that this model has. And these general properties, I'm just summarizing 20 and 25 years of uh, uh, studies by great uh, physicists on the past, is encoded essentially in two main objects, which is group of symmetry and dimensionality of uh, the space where the system is defined. Okay? So this is uh, the framework. The framework is when C over A is diverging, of all the model, uh, or the model that you are looking for, the only thing that will matter for the further discussion solution of the model will be essentially two main quantity. The group of symmetry under which and the dimensionality of the space where the uh, your system is defined, okay? All the rest, essentially, you can forget it. Now, uh, behind all uh, this uh, scheme, uh, there is really extremely powerful ideas related to renormalization group. Now, I will try to give you really a glimpse how far and how powerful is this skipping all the detail, I say renormalization group is a subject in itself that has an endless number of reference, articles, and so on and so forth, especially if you are interested in technical detail. What I want to show you is uh, how you can really understand the basic things using ideas and vocabulary, way of thinking a la renormalization group. So the idea is uh, what historically is called block variable, that is due to Kadanoff and later push further by uh, Wilson, uh, Fisher, and so on and so forth. The idea is, uh, once we have a, a lattice in which you have a, essentially a basic cell, so in this case a square, so on this lattice you have a certain Hamiltonian which will be written in terms of uh, certain operator. So, I will write explicitly that this is uh, the effective uh, description of my system at lattice space A. Okay? So what I mean is, I fix my lattice space, I define my Hamiltonian at that scale, and I select out what operator are entering this expression. Looking above, lattice uh, spacing A, for easy model, one of the operator is uh, sigma i, sigma j, all next neighborhood, so it's one of them. The other one is sigma itself, 
Okay? And the coupling constant here I call G, generically. Okay? So there was J and B. Okay? Now in this I including uh, all of the, the things I needed uh, to, to describe the system at that scale, let's say. Now the point is, uh, when uh, correlation length is diverging, as we said before, the lattice uh, microscopic detail should not matter much. So this uh, uh, suggests that I might block, my, my, I might uh, organize my variable differently, so making a scale transformation, and look at the system on a different scale, like I have a magnified lens. Okay? So the idea pushed forward by Kanadov is uh, making uh, a system, uh, say, 3 by 3, so a scaling factor 3, for instance. So in this uh, new lattice, the rule is uh, I have to assign to this new lattice, the effective variable for this new block. Okay? So before I had a block that were, I mean, were a sigma variable that were defined on each side. Now I want to define what will be the new variable that I have to assign to the new lattice such that, this is the constraint or a normalization group, the physics will not change. So I can rephrase it, the normalization group philosophy with the famous statement of uh, Tommasi di Lampedusa. He say everything should change such that nothing change. Okay? So here means lattice space is changing, coupling is changing, the spin are changing, but the partition function is not changing. I will use this in a minute and I show you how can... Uh, severely constrain the free energy. Now, you might question, well, but seems to be an arbitrary freedom in how I will assign the spin here. It's true. Any renormalization group transformation has a commitment to a specific rule which assign the previous spin to the new one. So this rule is largely arbitrary as far as uh, physically sound. Okay? So something that you don't map all the spin to one, because this is crazy. Because you want to capture the fluctuation of your system on a larger scale. This is what you want to do. So, for instance, one uh, reasonable uh, uh, thing is, uh, I don't know, the decimation rule, namely, out of the nine spin, you just pick one randomly and you promote it to be the next spin. Okay? Or you can use the majority rule. This is why I choose nine. Because with nine, an odd number of them has to be one or the other. And then I promote a new spin to be the majority rule. Now, the key point of all the story is not the individual transformation rather the infinitely many iteration of it. Now, if you want to appreciate this beautiful mathematical idea, you have to look what in mathematics is called dynamical system, and in particular the logistic map. The logistic map is some map between variable to the other that you iteratively do. So essentially, what you are looking is composition of this rule. something which I denote like Fn, okay? And is a fact that I have no time to prove it, that as far as you choose a reasonable mapping of this type, the final result is largely independent of the form that you have taken as an individual transformation. So it will emerge a universal behavior, okay? This is the, the key point. So the key point is, uh, I want to change A now to a new lattice size, BA, 
to a certain rule. And you want to write what is here. Now, the key point of all the story, this is really the basic things, and I will use in a minute, is that if I choose properly the operator here, which will be a basis in the space of operator, so if I choose properly, namely if uh, I was uh, wrong at the beginning, I make rotation, I make a linear combination, I do something, I choose the right coordinate, let's say, what is going to happen is that if I choose this operator to be scaling operator, we'll see what it means in a minute. The nice thing that will happen is that to a different scale, BA, my Hamiltonian will take exactly the same functional form, namely, will be sum on GI OI, the same operator. And the coupling constant which is in front change multiplicatively. So the coupling constant in front here, G I goes in G I B two minus two delta E. And delta E is uh, the scaling dimension of this field. Yeah, I'm defining in a minute. Yeah. So, scaling operator at this, uh, at this stage is a definition. Is the following. If I change, so scaling operator. Definition is that I'm going already in the continuum. You will see that in any case. It means that if x, you rescale x over b, which on the lattice side means that you are rescaling a in b times a, a scaling operator are those that under this transformation change exactly like this. Okay. Now, in a more technical term, they are the eigenvector of the dilatation operator of field theory, whose eigenvalue will be delta i. I will uh, talk later in much more detail. Okay. In any case, uh, scaling operators are not generic operator; a very special operator, and are those which uh, change uh, if this is a dilatation, a rescaling. You see, it looks like you have the same field, so it looks like an eigenvector of this operation. But this uh, eigenvector brings with itself some eigenvalues, which are called scaling dimension. Okay? Yeah. Um, the rule for the is it a d to the power of 2 minus 2? Yeah. Uh, two, yeah. Sorry. If you are d, sorry, in d dimension, d. Yeah. Because... Uh, I have to distinguish two things. There are a certain level of discussion which is fully general in any dimension D. Then there are a certain level of technicality and complicancies which uh, uh, are different if you are in a generic dimension D or if you are in two dimension. Okay? But this will come in a minute. So if this is the case, so the, there is an if. The if is, if I choose to write my Hamilton on a scale A in terms of uh, the scaling operator, and later they will form a basis, so I can do it. This means I can do it. If I have done that, when I do a rescaling, the nice thing is that the Hamiltonian looks exactly as before. The only thing is I have updated my coupling constant. <laughs> Clear? So this brings it to a very powerful picture. The powerful picture is the following. Given a, a group of symmetry, you define the infinite dimensional coupling constant space associated to that symmetry. 
So the example of there in the lattice was just the simplest one. The simplest even operator is sigma i, sigma j. The simplest odd operator is sigma i. But you understand that if I start doing block variable, I start effectively coupling more and more spin. So for instance, a next z2 even operator will be sigma i, sigma j, sigma kappa, sigma l, with referring to different sides, and keep going, OK? So imagine that, uh, given a group of symmetry, you are able to identify all possible operators which has a specific uh, transformation around the group of symmetry, OK? So essentially, they are the irreducible representation of the group, technically speaking. Yeah, yeah, the coupling constant is the conjugate to the scaling operator. Yeah, yeah. Any scaling operator has an associated coupling constant, and they scale the same for the obvious reason that uh, the dimensionality of this object is fixed, and therefore, given how scale one, you know how to scale the others. Okay, so this is the conjugacy. So the sum of the two is D, essentially. So, in this infinite dimensional space, look this Hamiltonian on a scale A. So it will be a point. So you give me all possible coupling constants at that scale, and then is a point in this space. Then I make the block variable, and then if I have chosen the right basis, this guy has changed, so has moved. Okay? So, changing the scale, I'm inducing a flow in the coupling constant space. Clear? The point is where these flows are going. Now, if it was, uh, so this is an uh, uh, infinite generalization of really dynamical system in mathematics. Dynamical system in mathematics is a rule which assigns a transformation to variable, okay? And keep going. Sometimes it's done in discrete time. Here you can do in continuous time, but the idea is the following. Now, in a logistic map, you probably know that logistic map is the simplest possible transformation of this type where you have a variable x real at the time n, which is updated to the next one according to this with some control parameter r. Okay? Now, this was uh, introduced uh, many, many years ago to study evolution of species, how large a population grows. Because at first approximation, the next uh, step of population has to be proportional to the previous one, so this gives the linear behavior r times xn. But if they live in a limited space, the food available decreases consistently. So it's 1 minus xn. So this introduces a feedback. Okay? Now, you probably know that studying uh, this logistic map varying r, the behavior is incredibly complicated. You can have a bifurcation, you have chaotic orbits, you can have a lot of stuff. Okay? So you might wonder, if I translate this example in this context of infinitely many coupling, should be hell. Say, my God, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. Well, this is uh, how physics helps us. So this is not mathematics, it's physics. So it means that uh, I cannot have many crazy things here. And indeed, uh, unless you start really twisting your system, doing uh, something crazy, the behavior is completely very simple. What uh, is simple is that trajectory will flow without making any crazy things, and they will stop in some point which we will call critical points. <coughs> So 
So critical points are those such that the new GI is exactly equal to the previous one. Will not flow. Okay? So therefore the renormalization group flows because these trajectories are called renormalization group flows as the simplest possible behavior according to physics. Namely, they evolve until they met a fixed point. So in general, they connect two different fixed points, including also with that, the fixed point at infinity, which is some, some point that has to be there. Namely, trajectory, which are unable really to spot the closest fixed point and then flows to infinity. Okay. So this picture is really very painful because in modern language, a field theory is associated to this trajectory. Correspond to theory in which you have put together a bunch of fields, in principle infinitely many, under a group transformation. And you want to identify, given the group of symmetry, what is the topology of this space? Namely, what are the fixed points in these spaces and how they are connected one to the other. So this is uh, how in modern language is reformulate the field theory problem. Please. How do you say that all these points don't write formal symmetry? Like it will define it from distance. And maybe it's for... So on infinite real, like if you have these fixed points, then for example, you have different distances or on your... Distances in which... Uh, yeah, but I didn't define what distance is there. It's in coupling constant, eh? This is in coupling constant. But still, I have some, some maybe a well, difference of this coupling constant, and this, this one doesn't change after, after applying this transformation. So maybe this doesn't write uh, conformal No. The setting is... Uh, so. Given for granted that uh, till now I didn't talk about distances about these points, this is a manifold that you can uh, later embed also with matrix, so you can embed with usual stuff for manifolds. Given that, so there is no distance at the moment involved, what I'm saying is any system, once you specify the group symmetry, is associated to an infinite number of uh, coordinate, which tell me where the system is at the specific A. will arrive to that. Follow me as the way I'm saying. I mean, it's pretty logical. Don't put your own knowledge, otherwise you will screw up. What I mean is, uh, what you are saying is, uh, once I have a conformal field theory, so I have to develop this picture, here I have certain set of operators associated to it that I can use to deform the theory and eventually to break conformal symmetry. So let me write to it, okay? So the, the scheme is the following. So let me say it again. The scheme is any field theory, once you specify the group of symmetry, is an infinite bunch of coupling constant associated to the scaling fields. Okay? So these are some explicit examples. There I choose to write easy model only with one coupling, two couplings, all the rest zeros. But this is uh, very an accidental thing, because as soon as I start doing the normalization group, I'm going to produce next coupling. The more I go ahead, more I produce more and more and more. So from this point of view, it's much more uh, uh, logical to start from the very beginning formulating the theory in the infinite dimensional coupling constant space. Because if I do not have uh, a certain scale, I will generate it later. Okay? 
So, given that the model corresponds to a point in this space or a certain scale, when I apply RG, this point is going to move. And then I was telling you that the general behavior of this theory is that they might arrive to some fixed point, and the fixed point are those in which the evolution of the coupling constant GI under some transformation T, let's say, which in field theory is called beta function of the coupling G, of course it depends on all the others, is zero. So this is the condition of the fixed point. So fixed points are identified by the condition that all the coupling constant evolution vanished at that point. And you understand this is a highly nonlinear set of equations usually, so you might have many solutions. And indeed, we'll see, and this will be our basic uh, guiding uh, line, that if I choose a Z2 symmetry as the simplest, in the Z2 symmetric uh, space or coupling constant, we will have infinite number of fixed points that later we will able to pin down completely. Okay? So, meaning of fixed point. So, fixed point, so quantum field theory of the fixed point So, the quantum field theory which emerged at the fixed point will be our conformal field theory. Okay? So, I hope it's clear at least the setting. The setting summarizing. You start, I mean, is a, is a way of telling you the story. You can rephrase it if you don't like the initial starting point, you take other example. But in this uh, scheme, you had in mind a very concrete uh, statistical models back in your mind. This model might present a certain point, some phase transition, which happens when the correlation length diverge. At this point will emerge some universality behavior that you can ca capture by field theory simply because you can disregard the lattice details. And a field theory has this property. It's continuous theory doesn't care about that. That being said, the logic formulation of it is uh, once you have a group of symmetry which identify your system, you identify the corresponding monomials of the theory. You write it down the most general Hamiltonian with that. A certain coupling constant, a certain scale, the coupling constant assume a very specific value, which are initial value. But what matters for a normalization group is not the value that I assume, but what happens if you rescale. And moreover, what if you rescale infinitely many times, okay? So you are uh, focusing the attention on the later asymptotic behavior of this trajectory, and what happens is that they typically go in some fixed points. At the fixed point, you have a specific field theory because this is associated to the corresponding coupling constant here. This field theory definition, I'm telling you, is the conformal field theory we are going to discuss next. Okay? Now, if, uh, what about if you are slightly away from conformal field theory? This is what your colleague was saying. You are uh, able to spot breaking of conformal field theory, and this operator, if it's relevant in the usual sense of a normalization group, is going to drive you away from it. Because any fixed point, as is evident from this picture, will have a certain direction where you are entering it, in it. So this will correspond to a set of scaling operators which, technically speaking, are called irrelevant operators. But then, as also certain operators which push you away from it. So this means that if you are going to write in the vicinity of this, your uh, theory in terms of some action, which is conformal field theory, which is this one, 
perturbed by these operators. So what is happening? Of course, I can apply once again the picture I'm using. I can ask how this G are going to evolve. Solution, I'm not telling you here, you have to learn somewhere else. This is really the normalization group things. What happens is that if uh, the field whose variable is conjugate to GI is irrelevant, Irrelevant means delta i bigger than the dimension of the space-time. This coupling constant is going eventually to die. So it goes to zero, renormalized to zero. On the other hand, if the field is relevant, so this is relevant, this is irrelevant, when uh, you make evolve the renormalization group, this coupling constant G is going to grow. Means that you are pushing more and more far off from the initial point. Where you are going is a different story because we'll become strong coupling with respect to this fixed point. You see, I'm using a picture where locally I have a description in terms of these things. But where the theory eventually is going later becomes strong coupling problem and concern also with the topology of this space. Namely, are all fixed points reachable or they are probably separate in set and so on and so forth. So there is a big... Uh, uh, could you please associate the variable T with the scaling operator? So could you... Well, no, no, no. T is just uh, a, a variable. So T, if you want, uh, A, D of D, A. So what I'm doing is uh, rescaling A, my lattice space, by A plus DA and creating a variable which is adimensional. So this is the way how you infinitesimally see how the coupling is moving. So this is T. I mean, it's, uh, it's nothing uh, particularly deep. As I say, the scaling operator are a basis. So a generic operator I shall be able to write as a probably finite sum, infinite sum, but in any case I can express it in terms of them. So for that reason, scaling operator is uh, the natural field in which I can formulate my theory. You see? Other questions? Sorry. I didn't get the question. So does the does the flow of the field theory always go to a CFT or only an psi No, as I said, as far as you include in this picture, in this geometrical picture I'm setting uh, for, as far as you include also the trivial fixed point at infinity, I could uh, use the terminology it always goes to a fixed point. But then I have to include the fixed point at infinity, which is the trivial one. So trivial one, uh, just for, uh, for uh, you see, fixed point are when uh, correlation length also goes in correlation length. But then this equation admit two solutions, either x is infinity or x is zero. So from this point of view, also x equals zero is a fixed point, trivial one, okay? So if you don't make uh, fine tuning or you don't really proper uh, choose your theory, typically you go really to massive uh, theory and that's it, the end. Massive theory in this language means x zero in a way, even though x is finite, but uh, in any case it's not infinity, okay? So as far as you include the point at infinity, the picture is pretty general. So the point that you can avoid, for instance, uh, crossing uh, of this trajectory at uh, points which are different from the fixed one is due to physics. 
because physics means that uh, once you give me a description of a theory in terms of local variable, locality is important here, if I transform it, I should not have any ambiguity where the theory is going. So I cannot have a crossing point in points different from the fixed one. Okay? So this is physics. Is what I refer to physics. As well as, uh, in general, uh, you might have what is called uh, limiting cycle. Let me discuss a little bit this because uh, is uh, so you might think that uh, changing uh, t your variable is not going somewhere but is circling around. Okay? A priori, why not? I mean, after all, uh, you are looking the solution or the evolution of the coupling, uh, this might happen. Now, why this uh, is uh, somehow disregarding field theory unless you really want it? What I want to say is that you can tune the Hamilton to have that. But this is kind of uh, oddities. Why so? Because uh, a behavior like that implies a similar behavior in energy. So I never tell you T what was it. In any case, it's a scaling variable. It's A, D, A, but I could have chosen to be E, D over D, E. So I'm looking how the theory responds to different change of energy. Okay, it's the same. So if you have a limiting cycle, this will uh, produce a very odd result in physics, namely that any observable lambda should be periodic with some period in energy. Now, unless the system has infinitely many scale, this can be impossible. Because if I take E goes to infinity, I overcome any possible energy structure the system can have. Think atoms. Hydrogen atoms has many infinite levels. Yeah, but if I take energy larger than 13 uh, erg, whatever it is, I'm overpassing all the possible scale. From there on, it's all the same. Clear? So, limiting cycle can only be associated to system that present a new structure no matter how I probe it in energy. So, I mean, when you rescale, you always rescale towards larger scales, right? You can go back from an average to the initial configuration to generate the other. Yeah. So how do you go to, I mean, you cannot explore smaller scales, you cannot explore larger scales, and therefore the energy should be... Well, I mean, uh, okay, the, the way how you... The flow how you are looking, ultraviolet, uh, infrared, or vice versa, I mean, can be changed. I'm saying that you can rephrase it. Actually, thanks for the question, because this uh, poses a uh, uh, historical, uh, historical uh, confusion. The historical confusion is, uh, from statistical physicist's point of view, what you are really matter is how the behavior, uh, how the system behaves on larger distance scale, okay? But from particle physics point of view, what really matters is how the theory behave under energy rescaling, and you go to higher energy. So essentially, statistical physics and uh, field theory, particle physics has the arrow of the flow reversed, okay? So in any case, I don't want to enter in detail, this is really diverging discussion, I want, I want just to say that limiting cycle that from mathematical point of view might be possible because means that the matrix that you are diagonalized to get the eigenvalues are as uh, imaginary part as well. From physics point of view, it's pretty odd because will imply a system which, in energy at least, will admit uh, infinite number of structures no matter how you do it. You can cook up example of that. Uh, but it's not, how to say, familiar is not uh, simple, how to say, it looks uh, like an oddity rather than that. Okay, so from what we are uh, dealing uh, most of the time, we are dealing 
with these relevant and irrelevant operators. I left out explicitly the marginal case where delta is equal to D, which is the marginal case, because this is a pretty subtle case. Because this analysis and how you classify the operator relevant and irrelevant marginal is just first order. Now, marginal operator are those, uh, if you consider seriously what we have uh, discussed so far, are uh, those operators associated to a coupling such that if you rescale the lattice, the coupling doesn't change. That's what marginal means, okay? While the other either grows or, or goes to zero, this remains the same. However, this might be an effect of first order. If you go to next to, to the first order, yeah. If you go to the next order, what is marginal might turn to be marginal relevant operator or marginal irrelevant operator. Okay? So the only cases where an operator becomes really marginal to all order is when you have symmetry associated to it. For instance, if you have a group of uh, symmetry, there are currents. The currents never renormalized. And the reason is uh, that currents and uh, associated uh, charges, so you have currents, Jix, then you have uh, charges, which are the integral on space of this current. Now, the group, uh, if you have a group, these charges satisfy the commutation relation of your group of symmetry. Okay? And now you see the fact that you have a quadratic relation under which you can express each of them implies that uh, this operator should always maintain the engineering dimension. Because uh, if this rescale with some uh, things, this uh, commutator scale quadratically, but then it will be in contradiction with this one. So charges typically are those which are marginal operator, but for very good reason. So their anomalous dimension never renormalized. It will be equal to the engineering one, okay? So I'm saying uh, from abstractly point of view, when you diagonalize your matrices of RG, you find a marginal operator, so a uh, an eigenvalues which is exactly equal to the dimension, you might worry if this is really a marginal operator or just marginal operator at the zero order, and then if it's going to be dressed to the next one. So I will propose to stop five minutes, five, not ten, and we gather together here at 12.10.